<laughs> Good morning. How are you? Wednesday the 17th of May. <laughs> Big day tomorrow. I'm going to be 58. 58. Bad, isn't it? I don't think I look like I'm 58. I don't feel like I'm 58. I remember my mother telling me, oh, you don't feel, you know, she was 60 something. She said, you don't feel it. She said, you still feel like you used to feel when you were 20. I don't feel like I felt when I was 20. I must admit, I don't have the strength I used to have. But uh, I remember. Um, when I was 20, I learned about coronary bypasses and they seemed like a good idea to me. They were like, uh, it said, they're like um, uh, a facelift for the heart, you know. So, oh, let me see if I can just get the contrast a bit better. No. Uh, oh. Yeah, so uh, the idea was that, uh, you know what, when your face started sagging, you had a facelift, or if your boobs started sagging, you had a boob lift. So when your heart starts sagging, you have a coronary bypass. Get four new valves, not four new valves, four new pipes fitted, you know, like having a new boiler. And uh, <laughs> so I thought, hmm, how long am I gonna live? I'll probably live till I'm 80, I thought. Uh, when I was 20, I thought 80's pretty, you know, good run. So when would be the best time to have your new pipes fitted? So it seemed to me that the obvious time was about halfway, you know? Have, a 40 years of complete decadence and then another 40 years of complete decadence with a heart have your heart swapped out halfway through <laughs> so I decided to have a quadruple bypass when I was 40 when I was 20 <laughs> and so of course the, the big day came and when I was 40 and I was like hmm okay I do remember when when I decided to have my heart swapped about this time <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, trouble was there was really I was it was going quite well you know <laughs> so I thought hmm you know and also it's not that easy to have elective quadruple <laughs> bypass surgery I thought probably by the time I was 40 you would be able to do that you know it would be like um, all sorts of elective surgery would be uh, possible so I thought, you know, and I'd, I'd have the money, so I would just pitch up at uh, Harley Street or the British the National Heart Hospital or something and say, you know, is it all right with you guys if I just have a quick uh, rodding of the old pipes and a, and a quick changeover? Probably got some spare veins in my leg or something that I don't use much. Anyway, uh, for some reason, I... I didn't go ahead with it. I just decided that I was okay for the time being and no real point. So I put it off for a few years and every few years I've put it off for a few more years and now I'm nearly 58 and I'm, I'm still not really in the mood for it. <laughs> so I'll probably put it off for a few more years and then uh, but the good news is I think the longer I put it off the more life I'll have on the other side of it. So uh, working on my original basis that it should be done halfway through your lifespan. Uh, let's say that I have it done when I'm, let's say I, I sort of, my health takes a downturn and I have it done when I'm about 81 or something, then I'm gonna live till I'm 162. And that's good news, isn't it? That's good news. It's good news for me. It's good news for you. Bad news probably for the Department of Health and the British Dental Association. They're the only two people that will be bad news for. So, so, on that good news, I'm looking forward to my birthday. Like most dentists, I need nothing. I have no needs. We don't, do we? To be honest, the, the older I get, the simpler my life is. As long as I can pay the mortgage and the rates at the end of the day, I'm driving in a, in a 
newish second hand car, but I didn't even really want to buy that. It's my wife's put a load of pressure on me to throw away my perfectly good drives like a rocket Vauxhall Vectra with with a mere 120 something thousand miles on the clock you know and four doors all of which worked uh, for no reason at all other than the fact that it was uh, a crappy old wreck but you know there's women for you So uh, anyway, that was a head turn of that car, honestly. And not just because there aren't any more on the road. It's because um, whenever you drive into a station, everybody used to turn and look at you because they thought their taxi had arrived. You have to take what you get, don't you? <sighs> so what else happened? Oh, I had a woman in yesterday. Full, full dentures. Unusual for us private dental practice big on implants probably out of out of all of our patients I would say 1% wear dentures 1% so uh, she was a new patient she had no uh, she's 91 and a half had full dentures which she had made in 1942 and unfortunately recently by the last 20 years or so probably they started to be a bit uncomfortable so finally she got to the point where she couldn't wear them anyway we uh, we got them out and the bottom ones that uh, were calcified I had a big lump of calculus on them which is what was stopping them fitting so um, we had to remove that but it was quite funny because uh, I was making jokes about you know because it's like archaeology the more we took off the further back in time we were going so we went back past the death of Elvis Presley, the Beatles, rock and roll, and uh, and uh, right the way back to uh, VE Day, and then the Normandy landings, and then finally we found the denture. So we've got periodontology and endodontology. Now we've got dental archaeology. Actually, I wonder, from a scientific point of view, if you took a, if you drilled a core sample through something like that, whether it would tell you anything. Didn't there be any change in the composition of the scale over the years? I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave that fascinating research project to someone else. This bloody car turns itself off when you stop at a T-junction. It's very disconcerting. I never quite got used to it. I always think you're stalled, you know? Yeah, so we took all the old scale off, stuck some visca gel in it, and then uh, told her to come back next week, and if it's comfortable, we'll do a reline. She, the person who came in with her was quite surprised that we weren't going to make her a new set of dentures. And um, it's, you know, I mean, you might, you might make her a new set of dentures, mightn't you? But I don't think at 91 and a half, that's the right thing to do. Not because I think she's going to conk out. I mean, she could get another 10 years out of a set of dentures. But because um, when I went to take the top ones out, which were gun fitted, by the way, this is to, just to show you that they were her original set. Um, I couldn't get the top ones out. And that's because not because they were glued in, but because she was sort of guarding them with her tongue. Her tongue, her tongue was acting as a sentry to make sure that these top ones didn't go anywhere. Even when you know, she knew someone was trying to take them out, her tongue had got itself to the point where if there was any, any sign of any movement downwards in these dentures, it would snap to attention and jam itself up in the pallet and stop those dentures moving. And I had to tell her to uh, just uh, relax so I could take them out. And so when you see that, that, that's what we mean when we say don't make a new set of dentures because people will have to adapt. That's, that behavior has been learned over very, very many years and is uh, adaptive and very uh, good for her, you know? It's like a defensive, protective thing. And uh, you might make a, a new set of dentures that fitted better and fell down less, but 
her tongue wouldn't be there necessarily to do its defensive duties. So she would complain it was loose, whereas in fact her old dentures were probably looser, although they fell down less. Sorry if I'm confusing you. But if you've been in the job a few years, you'll know what I mean. The lower denture is a different matter. The lower denture is just floating about all over the place. So the better fitting that is, then the better she's going to cope with it. I'm always assuming that um, the bite didn't change. And I found it difficult to understand how the bite hadn't changed because they were jacked up right, right up at the front because of this calcification. However, when I checked the bite after I cleaned it all up, it looked reasonable and I think with the Viscogel in it, it's going to be okay. So, and so instead of having to shell out for all she's having is a lower reline, which we're doing for her on the same day. We're doing, um, she comes in I think before 10.30 and then we tell the lab in advance and then they do the reline and they're also going to repair a crack in our upper palate. Uh, and do it all within an hour or so, you know, and uh, that's um, that's a nice service. Very, very few people want to leave their dentures. So we're very lucky in that we've got a denture lab and a crown lab right next door. I mean, literally in the unit next to us. So, and we get on very well with them. So, um, the guy who does our dentures, sorry, this is his car. It's critical. I'm, everyone's critic. Everyone's a critic. Everyone's a critic. Now even my car is a critic. Yeah. So uh, dentures in a day. People don't want to leave their dentures. So what do they do? They go to a denture lab that can process them on the spot. Now what happens is we've got the, all the advantages of a of a dentist plus a denture lab that can process them on the spot. To have a co-located lab is great, and to have everything co-located is great. Uh, one of the next things I'll want to buy is, um, well, we want to buy a millimetric uh, 3D scanner, some sort of, uh, you know, high resolution scanner for the implant work and the uh, wisdom teeth work. And then I'd like to have a milling machine, that would be good. Uh, what I would do is I would put that somewhere where everyone can see it so that people can watch their crowns being made because I think that's fascinating. In fact, if I could have that out in the lobby, I would. Um, and the other thing we're doing, sorry about the bouncing, is the, uh, I'm hoping tomorrow I might get a surprise in the form of a, a better bracket for the phone, which doesn't wobble so much. I'm going to stick with the phone as a recording device because, except on the odd occasion where it has a has a fit, it has it actually is quite a reasonably good picture and sound quality. Probably not as good as a GoPro, but it's okay. Yeah, so we're doing dentures in a day. We can do a reline in a day, so why not do dentures in a day? So I said to the I said to the guy, Marcus, my technician, why don't we, uh, you know, how quickly can you do a denture? And he said, well, I could probably do it in a day. And Colin, who's our implantologist who lives in America, says that dentures in a day is all the rage over there. All the rage, he said. So what we're doing is, for, on a trial basis, and this is we've fed this into our radio advertising because we have a little radio spot on the local amateur radio. You know, unprofessional, not unprofessional. <laughs> That's, that, you know, on advertising, well, I mean, it's advertising supported, but it's a community radio. It's a community radio, angry. That's the word you're looking for. And uh, so the patient's gonna come in and we reckon that providing we can get the primary impressions out by about 10.30 we can do, then in the morning we can do the bite and the try-in and then in the afternoon uh, we'll do the processing and have it fitted so we'll have the fit ideally by about uh, 4 o'clock half past 3, 4 o'clock so we can have two patients a day booked in 
approximately uh, say uh, nine nine and nine thirty in the morning for impressions. Then the same people booked in at uh, three thirty and four. Come on, you muppet! Sorry, two big lorries. You want to go? Yeah. Going to help them get out because um, it's a junction that they find it quite difficult to get out from. <clears throat> Do you think if you let a bus out where no one else has been letting that bus out, <clears throat> do you think the bus driver thinks that you are actually another bus driver? Does he think, oh, here's someone, or does he just think you're, like, you're a considerate driver? Because I would assume if someone could see the problem that a bus was having when no one else could see that problem, they would assume <laughs> that you were, that you drove a bus. <clears throat> anyway, that's neither here nor there, is it, really? So, yeah, so, um, and the trying, obviously, has to be sort of a bit tidy, but it doesn't have to be brilliant. And the thing is that you can immediately, the, the great thing about the fact that we're doing it is that if it's not quite right, either the technician can come in or uh, I can just walk next door with it and say to the technician, like, can you rotate the laterals a bit or, you know, can you bring it all forward two millimetres or whatever. So that's great. And it's something that it's like a unique selling point, but not because we are the only people doing it, but because we are the only people that can do it. And that's the best type of USP, one that, one that your competitors will find hard to match. Because dentistry is a service industry, service sector, as opposed to goods and products. With goods and products, they have a certain amount of protection because if you design something, then you can get it uh, patented, can't you? You can take out a patent on something. And so if anybody else tries to do it, then they're liable to you, you know, in, in law for damages. But you can't patent a service. If you do something a certain way, you can't stop everyone else doing it the same way. So how do you deal with that, okay? And the way that you deal with it is that you recognize it and stay ahead of the curve. In other words, that you continue to improve your service at a faster rate than people can keep up with it. Because don't forget that they've got to, they <laughs> first of all, they've got to find out what you're doing, which is not that difficult because if you're any, you know, in, if you're a marketer in any sense, you'll be telling everyone exactly what you're offering. Then they have to figure out how you do it, <laughs> which you can be a bit more cagey about how you do it. And then they have to work out how they can do it. And that all takes time, and they might even choose not to, uh, not to, not to try and copy you. So, but in the meantime, so by the time they've sort of copied what you're doing on the Monday, on the Tuesday, you're doing something even better. So you have to stay ahead of the curve. And the way we're doing it is because we've got a lab next door, and very, very few dentists in Kent, certainly in East Kent are co-located with a lab or anywhere near a lab or even up the road from a lab where they could just walk up the road and do it we are literally it's the you go out of my door turn right in the next door there's the lab and so as a result we can significantly cut down on the uh, the wasteful time in between patient visits and so if you imagine how many visits is a denture you've got impressions Second impressions, buy, try, fit. Possibly a retry, five, or an, an ease, six. Uh, well, no, with well, ease, we might need an ease anyway. So say five. So that's five visits to the surgery uh, that you're condensing down to one. And uh, probably four or five weeks of the patient, yeah, don't worry, we've done the impression, that's got to go off. Let's get that boxed up, let's get that off to the lab, you know, in the box or get it collected and then what when's it going to be back oh well it's wednesday it'll be back next wednesday when will it be ready oh well then it'll be ready three wednesdays after that you know people and then and then when they come to us 
we basically we say to them if you get in here by 10 30 we can have it back by 4 30 finished new denture start to finish comfortable well fitting looks good brand new no, and we're not charging a fortune for this in fact we charged i think for our dentures about 6.99 I think that's per jaw. I don't know. I'd be surprised if that was for two. I think it's it might be for two. I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to find out. I'm not giving you any details of my pricing strategy anyway. You can look it up on the bloody internet. My website's public. So um, <clears throat> yeah. So we're not charging any more for just doing it in a day because we're going to see you know what the demand's like. If it really takes off, then. We may have a special fee for the in a day ones as opposed to the over four weeks. I anticipate that by the, you know if we do it in a day, then it'll become the de facto standard, won't it? I mean, who's going to say, oh yeah, no, I'd rather save a hundred quid and have it done over two months? Very few people. That was a rhetorical question. You didn't have to answer that. So, what else was going to say about dentures? The good thing about these videos, at least you know, apart from the one yesterday when I was rambling on about Bitcoin, that uh, they're only going to be 20 minutes long. Anyway, I'll put it, I'll put it up as a thing because I'll remember it, and it'll come up. I'll have a, you know, I'll have a brainstorm as soon as I get into the surgery. And there was one other point, sort of, I wanted to just make. That's it. Lovely. Sometimes I like it when this car beeps. Right. I don't know what I'm doing today. I don't know what I'm doing. This is an everyday a surprise for me. A pleasant surprise. Another day in paradise. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye.